Uh, I'm Scott Loveridge. I'm director of the North Central, Central Regional Center for Rural Development. And um, if folks could mute their microphones, I'm getting a little echo here. Uh, welcome to the seminar series we, we're hosting here this fall. Um, this is the first of our series. Please take a look at our website for, for some of the future ones. Um, it's great to be hosting this one today here with Mary Emery uh, leading this group. Um, Mary is department chair in the Department of Sociology at South Dakota State University, but she's worked with the center in a number of capacities throughout the years. Um, um, when the center was located at Iowa State, she was associate director and led uh, many initiatives, including um, around the areas of uh, community capitals and working with Native American populations. And so it's really a treat to have uh, Mary back here with us today, albeit briefly, to talk about this topic. And I'll, I'll let her uh, then introduce her colleagues. Thank you, Scott, and uh, welcome everyone to our webinar. Um, I'm going to just talk a little bit about how we came to be in this session with you today and then turn it over to our, the rest of our presenters. We have a small group of folks um, that were originally funded by the North Central Regional Center for Rural Development to get together and to look at what we can learn from each other about community change initiatives. And there is one of the archived uh, webinars that Scott mentioned is actually talks about what we learned from the community change uh, project. Um, but after looking at what we can learn about what is working in different places with community change, uh, we started to ask some questions about how do we know that we're really making a difference and what's really going on in these circumstances? And we found that there are a lot of people that have interest in this question and so we wanted to put together some examples of how people are starting to work with that question of how do you really measure change in community change initiatives. But we think it's particularly important to be looking at this because there's been a lot of investment in community change initiatives, both within foundations, within extension, um, and within uh, state and local governments as well. So we want to know, do these initiatives really make a difference? How do we know we know? And we want to talk a little bit about what makes measuring community change um, a difficult task, at, to say the very least. And we have some really great presenters here to talk about their experiences. First, Mylon Wall, co-director of the Heartland Center for Leadership Development, um, will be talking a little bit about how they're working with communities on helping them build capacity to measure community change. He will be followed by Liz Weaver, who is one of the a member of the evaluation team for the Tamarack Project in Canada, which has been looking at reducing poverty in several Canadian areas. And then finally, Tom Kelly, who is um, the head evaluator for the Annie E. Casey Foundation, will talk about what they've learned about from their work with community change initiatives in the last uh, 10 years, actually. So without uh, too much more ado, let me turn it over to uh, Mylon, and he can start the presentations. And now Mylon needs to unmute his mic, so don't forget to unmute. Okay, Scott, how's that working? Scott, are we on? We're hearing you fine, Mylon. Go ahead. <laughs> okay, thanks. Um, well, thank you very much, Mary, for um, the introduction, for the chance to participate in today's session. Um, what I'm going to be talking about is something that we call the hierarchy of community impacts, which, as Mary said, we developed here at the Heartland Center as a way 
to work with communities that we're partnering on to help them develop uh, change strategies uh, to set priorities for positive change in their communities and to um, figure out ways from the very start to measure change impacts. This uh, hierarchy um, is sort of conceptualized by the bullets that, that are on the screen now. Um, you know, why another evaluation model? We have a lot, lots of evaluation models around. And um, this one we really put together as a way to help community leaders uh, talk about and measure community change from the very beginning of a, of a change process. So it's really designed for community leaders. It's designed in a way that community leaders can self-administer uh, this approach. Uh, we're trying to minimize scientific jargon as much as, as possible. One of our experiences here at the Heartland Center with evaluation models and uh, community leaders is that um, if they seem overly complex or academic, uh, folks sort of throw up their arms in, uh, in frustration and say, well, I can't deal with all that stuff. Uh, uh, let's uh, help me figure out a way to simplify this so I understand it so I can share it with my community colleagues. We also want to come up with something that was easy for community leaders to use. And so this conceptual framework is designed in a way that community leaders can uh, easily put it into practice. Um, we also wanted something that doesn't require a huge amount of time, but that's relatively simple and straightforward. And then uh, probably the chief among the considerations we had in mind was to allow for assessment of impacts from the very get-go of a project implementation. Um, one of the things that uh, we believe frustrates community leaders about evaluation is that uh, stakeholders, whether those stakeholders be the, the town council or the county board of supervisors or a, a distant funder, are always interested in numbers and yet uh, Oftentimes, we tend to think that it, it takes a considerable period of time to get to the kind of numbers that really um, measure something significant. So we try to come up with a way to help community leaders do this from the very start. So here in a graphic format um, is, a, uh, is a hierarchy. Uh, starts out with activities, and I'll spend uh, a few minutes uh, momentarily walking up this hierarchy and explaining what we mean by these with an example out of our work in leadership development. So we go up the hierarchy from activities to outputs to what we call commitments to outcomes. And then uh, finally, and most significantly, in, the, in terms of systems change, to indicators of systemic change. So that's the, the the graphic, and let me walk through the explanations with you real quickly, and then I'll see if some if somebody has a, a question. So again, this is taken from a leadership development program example. A lot of our work revolves around helping communities start and implement leadership programs. So um, at the activities level, at the simplest level, uh, it's uh, for example, has a program been created? Very simple, straightforward. We started a program. This is what the program looks like. Uh, this is um, how people are engaged in the program. Uh, these are the number of people who signed up for the program. Uh, we meet this many times over this period of time for how long? Uh, very, very simple. Uh, from uh, from the very beginning of a program engagement. Um, this uh, provides a way for a local leader to say to the local funding agency or funding agencies, uh, we got our program off the ground. We have 20 people engaged. Their uh, age ranges are um, 
this, that, and the other, and so forth. Then it's, as we move up that pyramid, we go to something we call outputs. Uh, what is the program producing is basically how we define output. So an example is uh, our participants attending, what's the average participation per session. Um, an output might be a uh, responses to a uh, workshop. If it's a series of workshops, responses to uh, each workshop as you go through it with questions similar to the ones that Scott will be putting up today at the end of this a webinar delivered workshop just to say um, you know take a, a, a quick snapshot of participants satisfaction from session to session again trying to be uh, real simple uh, so that the community leader can go to the county board or the town council or the chamber of commerce or the economic development authority whomever and say hey um, this is the kind of average attendance we're getting, and here's what participants are saying about um, their satisfaction with what we're working uh, through with them in the in leadership program. Uh, the next level is what we call commitments. So here we're saying, uh, so what are the what are the uh, folks who go through the program and complete the program? Um, what do they say about what they're intending to do uh, based upon what they learn? Many leaders development programs, as an example, will ask uh, participants to make a public commitment to what, as to what they intend to do. Uh, I helped uh, uh, Community Nebraska, David City, Nebraska, start a leadership program a couple years back, and one of the things that the participants did on graduation day was to write their commitment on a three by five card. They got up in front of all of their classmates, read what was on the card, and then threw it in a hat that was placed on the table in front of them. So it was a, a public expression of what they intended to do. And the examples were, I expect to do more volunteering in my community. I expect to be more active in my Lions Club. Uh, someday I'd like to run for public office. Those were the kinds of things that folks said they intended to do. And then uh, another version of measurement would be to track alumni of the program and find out whether they really acted on their commitments. Did they do what they said they were going to do? And then we move up uh, the hierarchy one more step to outcomes. Uh, what community improvements have resulted? So can we look across the community and see that there are actual uh, community improvements? Is the Lions Club making a greater contribution to community betterment? Um, uh, as an example, um, are more people running for public office and so forth? And then finally, at the very top of that pyramid are what we call indicators of systemic change. And these are the, the long-term impacts. Um, for example, has the pool of people uh, engaged in community development, um, is that different today than it was? Is it more diversified? Are there younger faces, uh, people f of color, uh, new faces? Uh, can we take a look at uh, the folks that are engaged in leadership and say, yeah, there's been a difference, and uh, this uh, difference we can tell by looking. Uh, eventually, again, we hope we can tell by uh, systemic changes and how the community goes about conducting change strategies. So um, in a nutshell, that is the hierarchy and how we explain it, how it's conceptualized. And uh, I'll stop there, uh, Scott. and. Um, see how uh, you want to proceed with uh, maybe you just want to go through all of the presentations and see if people want to put up a question in the chat box or whatever but I'll stop there yeah I'm here. okay well I'll ask a, a quick one here one of the you know we've been looking at this from the extension side of the house uh, here in the north central region and 
and uh, the questions of, of um, you know, we're we're sort of in in, in many ways we're we're sort of put head to head with other types of community and economic development programs in in the extension programming that happens in the land grant system. Um, what about an indicator like jobs and job creation? Have you thought about how that, how a leadership development program could translate into uh, systemic change along those lines and, and how to measure that because it's such a long-term process? Sure, sure. Well, yeah. Um, one of the communities that uh, we've been working with now um, through the a hometown competitiveness framework. We've been working with them for a little over, I think, eight years. And uh, we started with them by helping them develop a leadership program. Um, what we see in, uh, re in recent data that's related to wealth creation uh, is that uh, per capita income in this community has significantly increased. So we're looking at, uh, at measurable indicators of systemic change that uh, uh, forecast or actually uh, document uh, changes in family income. And uh, I wouldn't say that that's totally uh, a, a product of the leadership program, Scott, because um, this community set out to uh, uh, three significant priorities from the get-go. One of them was to uh, strengthen leadership, but others were to um, work uh, with locally owned businesses to help them figure out ways to grow or expand. And then a, a third major um, goal was to help businesses go through ownership transition as uh, previous owners entering retirement age. So there was a, a, a kind of a um, purposeful integration of leadership development with economic development in that community. But to answer your question, uh, yeah, we can, we can see more jobs uh, and better jobs in that community. That has happened since uh, they started down this road. Does that answer your question, Scott? Okay, thanks. Very good. I think maybe we we'll just go on with uh, the next presenter. I think that's me. I think that's Liz. Yep. Yeah. Great. Well, I'm going to talk to you today about um, what we've been learning through our Vibrant Communities Initiative, which is a, an initiative um, that works across Canada with 13 cities, and we have one goal, which is really um, the reduction of poverty and how we do this is in a kind of cross-community, cross-sectoral kind of way, and so I'll talk a little bit about it. One of the key premises behind um, this initiative is really to understand the nature of poverty and our vibrant community partners um, really look at poverty as a complex kind of issue where there's no one single cause or no one single solution. And that it really, in order to um, be able to attack the issue of poverty, you really do need to have all orders of government working together and working in collaboration with the different sectors that you can find in your communities, including local government, business, the voluntary sector or the NGO sector, and also with people who have the lived experience of poverty um, sitting at the table. So Vibrant Communities is a, it's an, it was a, it's, we're coming to the close of it, but it was a 10-year experiment designed um, to address the complex realities of poverty through local level action. And so we were guided by our theory of change. and. Our local community partners really bought into um, the five principles and um, participated in the design of that. Our communities really crossed across Canada, and you can see here um, the 13 communities that have been involved with vibrant communities. Some of them um, started and stopped, and others um, began. We had a group of six that began with us early, and then another group of six that we called trail builders that came along with us um, at the next stage. 
Our approach basically, um, we call it the five puzzle pieces approach. At the very center, we ask communities to really understand the nature of poverty in their community. And so it, this approach, I think, lends itself a lot to any kind of um, community change effort that's dealing with a complex issue. So at the center of the complex issue is the issue. And, you know, when you're bringing a cross-sectoral collabor collaborative table together, all of your conceptions about the issue, whether it's poverty or healthy communities or economic development or neighborhood revitalization, each of you comes at the issue from a different perspective and a different lens. And so one of the very first tasks is to get kind of some agreement and understanding um, of what that complex issue is. And what we asked our communities to do was to engage in a poverty matrix where they really looked at the demographic um, uh, impacts of poverty on the community and then also to engage in a dialogue about what poverty meant to them as uh, leaders engaged in this work. Uh, the second puzzle piece is really, as I mentioned, the multi-sector collaboration. What's critical to this collaboration is that um, the voice of individuals with the lived experience of poverty is at the table and, and along with business, government and the uh, voluntary sector. Um, it's that mix of voices that we believe really gives us some significant leverage and some significant change. The third puzzle piece is really to look at it, at, um, look at poverty or whatever issue from not just a single source um, solution, but really try to look at the issue in a comp from a comprehensive lens. And then what type of activities will you undertake when you're looking at the issue comprehensively? The um, fourth puzzle piece is really to look at the assets that already exist in the community and how they can be leveraged um, to really drive forward the community change effort. And then the fifth puzzle piece is really looking at um, taking on a learning and change uh, perspective. So testing things, uh, both having some success and also failing, but always learning from what you're doing. So it's a, a learning and doing kind of orientation. Um, we, because we had 13 communities engaged in this work and we wanted to understand the um, on the ground change that was happening for individuals and households, we um, determined that we needed a framework where we could monitor this change and the sustainable, after much discussion, the sustainable livelihoods um, assets Pentagon approach really helped us understand um, the differences that these community change efforts were making in the lives of individuals and their families living in poverty and the degree to which we were improving um, assets, whether it's physical, personal, financial, human, or social assets for individuals living in poverty. And I'll talk a little bit more about that um, in a few minutes. But having a, uh, when you're working with 13 very diverse uh, communities, having a single framework um, really was quite a useful exercise for us and really helped us kind of understand how the change was happening at both the community level, but how it was also happening at the national level. We, um, like Mylan talked about in terms of his hierarchy of outcomes, we actually looked at four levels of community change or community outcomes um, and asked our vibrant community partners to report on these um, twice a year. Um, one was on decreased poverty, the second level was on increased community engagement, the third on increased community capacity, and then policy and systems level change. These are the results that we reported in um, June of 2010. Now, we've had our partners uh, report their changes um, since then, and our numbers, if you look at um, the poverty reducing benefits. Um, this, I just took this uh, slide from our evaluation report, but um, we're now up to over 195,000 households and individuals that have benefited. So it's, it's quite a significant amount of change that has happened across the communities. Um, some of the lessons, we've just uh, uh, completed a eight year retrospective of these uh, 13 communities and some of the lessons that we learned when you actually bring people together and work collaboratively, um, we learned that you can raise the profile of poverty, that you can build a constituency of change, which includes both some of the traditional voices that would be engaged in this work, but a lot of the non-traditional voices. It really does include, encourage new um, collaborative ways of working and that we begin to see 
some of that higher level systems change or system shifting um, that we believe will lead to the higher scale change for poverty reduction, but it has to really begin at the local level. Um, but it, you ha also have to think about what the, how the individual, the programs that you're doing to shift individual and household assets, how that can be um, transformative for policy and systems change. Um, some of the success factors that we um, <clears throat> determined with our 13 partners was that you need to have uh, influential and credible conveners at the local community level. Those influential and credible conveners really um, are critical in the uh, first stage of development in terms of bringing people to the table and um, getting them engaged in the work. A cross-sector connected leadership table, one that is um, working not only around the table but is connected into other networks in the community and can bring those other networks in to help leverage and push uh, poverty reduction efforts is also a, a critical success factor. Um, a challenging community aspiration, our, uh, our partners um, each developed a theory of change or framework for change approach, and many of them had challenging uh, community aspirations. In St. John, New Brunswick, for example, they wanted to reduce um, poverty by 50% within five years, um, and they've actually made significant strides towards that. Um, in Hamilton, the aspiration is to make Hamilton the best place to raise a child. So those challenging community aspirations are really a way of gaining momentum and focus on the poverty reduction efforts, but also pushing um, the work forward and reaching out beyond um, the collaborative table to engaging um, the community in a broader perspective. Uh, clearly articulated purpose and approach. So the framework for change approach was very uh, significant for our communities in terms of both articulating um, how they're going to tackle poverty, but then also communicating it beyond um, their collaborative roundtables. Uh, resident mobilization, including the voices of people with the lived experience, is really critical. It, it um, really gives momentum to the work, and it also gives a sense of urgency, particularly when you're dealing with an issue like uh, poverty. For, by including the voices of lived experience, um, they want solutions now, and uh, that actually gives momentum for change to the uh, collaborative roundtable. And then critical, uh, the final kind of critical success factor is um, really ensuring that you have enough research to inform the work, but not get into analysis paralysis, which can sometimes happen in these uh, these collaborative kinds of efforts, but um, the, the, you certainly do have to work from that uh, strong base of research. We have um, an evaluation report that's available on our website, um, and so I've uh, included a link here. Um, you can learn more about uh, vibrant communities through our website and through the Tamarack Community website. There's also a ton of other resources um, for individuals that are engaged in collaborative work um, on the website. And uh, so I invite you to go there and learn a little bit more. We are also entering into um, phase two of our evaluation, which should be out um, probably November uh, or December of this year, where we're looking at um, what kinds of national supports are really required to help this kind of community change effort um, become very successful. And so that, uh, that will be posted on our website in November, December of this year. So I'm done. Thanks, Liz. Uh, this is Scott Loveridge again. Um, one thing that was really struck me as incredibly powerful is, and you've got it sort of on the cover of your evaluation report. So I was going to go back and go back to the earlier slide, but you've got you know pieces of it here, and that's this uh, you know the the total impacts that you're you're able to report. So. I guess two questions on that is first, you know, how did you get people to tell you that this is going on? And secondly, um, you know, has the has the government government of Canada noticed? You know, are, are you uh, are you taking this forward and, and telling this story and um, to policy? Absolutely. Um, so the the vibrant community partners um, 
we, uh, during our process, um, uh, negotiated back and forth with our partners on the reporting criteria, and we came up with a criteria that measured those four levels of change and um, uh, set up a framework for them to report on uh, twice a year. And, you know, they've been pretty good at uh, uh, giving us the reports, and we have um, an evaluator that uh, we work with who, you know, checks back with them if he doesn't quite understand, and he's been with us for the process overall. So he checks back if he's not sure about, you know, what a community is reporting or, you know, if there are some challenges. And then we also report back to the communities once they've um, given us their results. We report the collective results back to them as a check-in through our conveners, our uh, vibrant community conveners um, meet bi-monthly by teleconference. and so. We'll have, uh, we'll have questions about the results that we've seen or some of the trends that we're noticing, and we invite them to give us, you know, their perspectives and their dialogue. So users are very much engaged in both the development of the questions, the, con the contribution of the data, and then their perspectives on the results that uh, we're seeing. Um, we, with this evaluation report, we've taken a pretty active uh, dissemination strategy. So not only have we, um, you know, disseminated it back to our vibrant partners, but we've also, um, and we've gone into each of our vibrant partner communities and talked about the results as a whole and also their contribution, that particular community's contribution to the results. We've engaged with national partners in pre presenting our results, and we are, um, the federal government in Canada was a funder, so they've been involved in both the design of the evaluation. They were one of our key stakeholders when we said, you know, what kind of information would you like us to, you know, obtain through this evaluative process? Um, so we got them engaged in really a user, a user way in terms of the evaluation results. And we're also um, working not only at the federal government level, but then um, there are seven provinces and three territories in Canada that have um, poverty reduction strategies at a provincial or territorial level. And so we've also engaged with um, government stakeholders at, at, the, uh, at the provinces and at the territorial government level to communicate the results. So it's been uh, pretty active dissemination. And have they taken steps based on the information that's coming back? Are they are they pushing to implement this in other places, or you know, are they wanting to fund you to do more communities, or what's what's in kind of the the, the response from the, the dissemination efforts? So for those provinces that have developed poverty reduction strategies, what we've noticed, even though um, we work uh, directly with 13. Um, cities to reduce poverty in the time that uh, provincial governments, which have really been quite significant over the last two or three years, um, have been developing their own provincial strategies. Um, uh, we've been working with a whole bunch of other cities where collaborative tables have been emerging. Even though you know, we have our 13, we've, the lessons that we've learned we've shared really broadly and, and has supported this movement overall. And our next phase, um, we're calling Cities Reducing Poverty, and uh, we'll be expanding to what we hope is 100 um, cities across Canada to continue this work and to um, start to really understand uh, wider scale change in these cities and communities. We know that there's, you know, currently about, uh, we have contact with about 60 um, other cities where there are collaborative roundtables with a focus on poverty, and so they're part of that new catchment group that um, that we'll start to reach out to in our next phase. Okay, thanks a lot. Looks like Betsy has a question here uh, uh, in the chat box. If you want to take a look at that, um, she's she's. Um, kind of asking the question about passing the baton on to other community leaders you know it, one once you've kind of got the ball rolling how do you how do you how do you kind of move it on to to somebody within the community to, to keep it going so that you can you know kind of graduate a community and, and move on and have have them continue to be successful that's uh, that the whole um, notion of collaborative governance is it's a really it's been a very interesting one to observe in our 
uh, the communities that we've worked with. Some of them haven't um, haven't passed the baton on as uh, elegantly as they could. Um, there, the role of a fiscal sponsor or a convener is a very important role for these collaborative roundtables because many of them exist um, not as their own entities, but as exist as part of uh, another organization sponsoring them. And we've typically seen the convener organizations come from the local government um, or the municipal government is a, often a convener. Um, United Ways or community foundations have often played the role of convener or the local social planning council. And um, what we've observed in terms of the collaborative governance is that uh, that convener relationship is a, is a critical one in terms of the structure of the entity overall. Often the conveners will remain with the roundtables um, and will play the role as the fiscal sponsor, but also a member of the roundtable. And it's that kind of balance between, you know, uh, not only holding some of the decision-making criteria, but also, you know, being a member of a broader decision-making body. So um, it's, a, it's a very interesting um, relationship. Okay, thanks. So we've got some people that have raised their hands. Uh, we really don't have anything to. Uh, you got to sort of type it into the chat box if you got a question. We we're not passing the audio uh, to the participants. So if you could just put your questions in the chat box, that would be great. Um, I think we're ready to move on to Tom now. And Hello. Okay. Hello, this is Tom Kelly from Annie E. Casey. Uh, I'm based here in Baltimore, Maryland. Uh, the Casey Foundation is a national U.S. private foundation uh, dedicated to outcomes for America's children, mostly vulnerable children. Um, we're a large U.S. funder uh, that has expanded its focus that began with foster care and child welfare outcomes into the variety of community and family supports for kids, um, particularly a focus on some place-based neighborhood uh, community level strategies as well. Um, uh, my presentation complements both Mylan and Liz's, um, and I'll point those out. Uh, we began uh, uh, more than 10 years ago with a place-based traditional community change initiative in 22 cities beginning in 2000, and then in 2002 focused uh, the entire uh, implementation on 10 cities in the U.S. located here. Uh, within those cities, we focused uh, specifically on about one to three neighborhoods. Uh, the geography was focused on an approximately um, 28,000 people on average. I'll just point out an aside, we began with uh, hypothesis that we didn't want to get larger than 12 or 14,000 people, but communities often included uh, adjacent neighborhoods. Um, we specifically targeted neighborhoods with high degree of childhood poverty, so high percentages of children living below the U.S. poverty level. Uh, the questions that we asked ourselves as part of the evaluation, and I led the evaluation of the 10 sites um, here from Casey, was, was focused, so similarly as Liz concluded, with the outcomes for children and families in these neighborhoods of concentrated poverty. Um, could we achieve them? What, in fact, those, income, those outcomes should be? Um, and I'll just mention them in a moment. Uh, we also, though, wanted to see about the influence that these initiatives would have locally on the neighborhood's uh, policy, their organizational systems, their relationships, um, whether they could attract more funding, uh, whether there were any system or policy changes that occurred. And particularly at this end stage of the initiative, we were very interested in whether the work that was continuing on the ground would be sustained beyond Casey's funding uh, ending in 2011 or 2012, and also whether or not there were any ripple effects or scaling of the work that had occurred. Um, we did have a focus on child and family level outcomes. Uh, uh, 
our numbers uh, look different from the ones that Liz just presented, but we had very similar categories of asking people to document uh, job placements, uh, assets being brought to families, whether it's uh, housing or savings accounts. And my presentation here is not going to focus on those child and family level outcomes, but looking at those three bullets, three remaining bullets here of, um, you know, where could we look at particularly interim indicators and measures of change in these communities, the process evaluation or the implementation evaluation, and how could we, in fact, link it to the outcome evaluation focused on children, families, and neighborhoods. This was a big gap uh, in a lot of our measurement plans, I'll say, at the beginning of the initiative, which we spent a lot of time looking at neighborhood level surveys, uh, program and neighborhood level implementation data, um, but really struggling in the evaluation on answering these questions. What, in fact, had occurred in the development of the work within these uh, 10 places? Um, I'll just lift them all up. We did have, and this is a very uh, high-level schematic of what the overall theory was for the initiative. Um, it really was about connecting families and connecting these neighborhoods to economic opportunities for jobs and asset building, uh, connecting families amongst each other, not only for social networks for supports, but also connections socially outside of the neighborhood, um, and also making sure that families were connected to effective services and supports that they needed when they needed. Um, each of those kind of outcome categories or buckets did have um, uh, I'll say categories of change that we were looking for, um, increased earnings and income. So this meant work, not just jobs, jobs with benefits, types of jobs with career potential. We did look at asset building, not only the financial asset building with savings accounts, retirement, other, but also things like access to uh, financial products and services, uh, things like insurance, car insurance, we would even look at more neighborhood level metrics on just availability of credit. Um, over time, this led to issues of um, not just redlining, uh, which we still found in our neighborhoods, but also things like, uh, believe it or not, starting in our 2003 survey, seeing those early warning signs of predatory mortgage lending that was going on in our neighborhoods as early as 2002. Um, and in addition, looking at particular services and supports, not only for the family but for, for the children, looking at the early childhood from sort of birth to age eight, uh, over time we got better and clearer about the child outcomes and focused specifically in that healthy birth, kindergarten readiness, and third grade reading success for children. Um, the investments from Casey really were focused on uh, providing technical assistance um, initiative implementation money, uh, the sort of glue and mortar uh, to run the initiative, and also some leveraged co-investments that included for us some social investments, which were endowment investments in uh, uh, sort of market rate uh, activities that had a social benefit return. Um, our theory about how to achieve this really was about the community change portion, and what did it take to achieve putting all of this together in a way that would achieve child-level outcomes in the long term. Um, getting to agreement on what uh, these elements were really was the basis of the early years in the initiative. Um, it certainly builds on many of the things uh, mentioned in both of the previous presentations, but also what the community change field knew and had known up to this point from initiatives that had occurred in the 90s. Um, specifically, though, in the evaluation, we were struggling with then how and what to measure in this section. And uh, we began with my lead evaluator, Mary Aschatz from Westat, um, using Bev Parsons' uh, stages of systemic change. Um, we were struck by this for a few uh, reasons. First was this uh, developmental approach, really thinking about the, the changes that a community will go through in order to change what she called old systems or business as usual into a, a 
making sure that a new way of working together uh, becomes not only relevant but a dominant way of working um, right through the development of these six stages. She also named elements of change that we felt had a lot of relevance and uh, was very complementary to some of the definitions that were already being surfaced by our local sites. And again, these are now at this point 10 sites across the U.S. implementing similar categories of work but not necessarily implementing the same strategies. So we use BEVS uh, stages of systemic change and essentially adapted it slightly for ourselves and our initiative. Um, we did begin with six stages just as so she had. Uh, we did work in a participatory manner with all of our sites to get some agreement that this was a, the right way to work, get some agreement on what these stages meant and perhaps what the elements um, that we could put in these stages would be. One of the first things they pushed back on, actually, was this issue of um, sustainability not only being, uh, in this case, in a matrix or column, but a lot of attention on the issue of sustainability being kind of a row or an element, meaning that each of these elements had to think about sustainability across the entire developmental spectrum. Um, in addition, we spent time really thinking about what work was going on for each of these. These are really the activities that the initiative spent the most time on, also spent the most money on, uh, and wanting to figure out if, if we could get agreement across 10 cities into essentially the use of a kind of developmental framework as well as the elements that were going into their work. And this does represent a kind of common frame across our 10 cities. What it also enabled us to do, however, was to spend the time with each site individually to decide what, for example, a partnership with key institution would look like in this particular city. Um, what we did not want to do from the cross-site evaluation was come up with some generic indicators that were perhaps not relevant. So, for example, in a community where the United Way and our community foundation were quite strong and instrumental in implementing service and system changes, we wanted to make sure that then that was reflected in a partnership with a key institution. But yet in another city, if the United Way wasn't as important, um, just including a sort of United Way checklist would not really represent the true change that was going on in the community. So again, we shared a kind of sense of developmental stage we shared a definition of elements. We worked individually with the sites to determine their individual indicators uh, that would show progress across this. The process, actually, um, we then engaged annually. I'm sorry if that keeps blinking. It should not have. Um, uh, occurred annually uh, with each site. It uh, generally was a one to two day event where all the partners were convened together. Uh, the, my lead evaluators would facilitate the meeting. Uh, we did not show the matrix as a scoring sheet to folks. This was actually an engaged discussion over two days around uh, really prompting about questions about their work. And the evaluator was then using the discussion and the evidence that people would raise, the, the documented examples that would represent progress, the evaluator was responsible for sort of capturing it um, and feeding it back to the group in a document after the fact that did, in fact, use the matrix and use the scoring. Um, over time, we developed a kind of, the best way I would say it is a high, medium, low for each stage. Um, so you could see a sort of, you know, when you're just entering a stage, sort of in the middle, and as you get it more advanced, in essence, that then created a three three points times five stages. So we had a 15-point matrix. I don't think the points were necessarily important, but it was a good way for people to track their own progress. Um, as the cross-site evaluator, I was less worried about comparing one city to another, and more. it was more important for me for community to see its own progress against its own baseline. Um, each element had its own row, so to speak, and so we were very, this is just an example, of one element where there could be some very specific examples and uh, types of events or activities that would demonstrate that they had moved from one stage to another. 
Um, uh, this process was done in every site annually. I will say that we had two sites with, who were, um, I'll say, my best examples where this process of self-assessment with the facilitation of an evaluator actually helped them in their work almost in a strategic planning sense that they actually chose to use this method um, for organizing all of their work. So they literally would have a one to two day session just on workforce strategies and a one day session on early childhood strategies to really help everyone and all the partners um, see their role in the work, uh, understand where they had been and what the baseline had been. Um, over time, the process really did uh, do several things, um, certainly for me in the cross-site evaluation, but also for the sites. The first was we were able to use a common framework across sites. We could at least talk about the work of the sites, the, the messy, different, and uh, idiosyncratic uh, change work that was going on on these sites. But we were able to use uh, some definitions and categories that were common. Um, we yet also were able to really give folks uh, individualized indicators of the work locally where they were most relevant. Um, it was really important for them to understand their own change uh, and not worry about a cross-site evaluator who was necessarily ranking or scoring sites um, uh, without some local context being uh, specified. We used the word evidence, but in this case it was a prompt for sites to really name uh, the reasons why they felt they were making progress with some really clear documented examples. Um, this participatory reflection process was both a participatory and its evaluation in that we did work with them to set up the scoring system and actually talk about the indicators, but and also just the process of their participation in their own self-assessment was a big step in getting them to understand particularly the big picture. Um, another thing that had happened was uh, this really was an intervention in that um, some of the sites who had had perhaps uh, uh, less intensive relationships with certain partners, the process of actually going through a self-assessment like this enabled them to bring uh, a more common understanding of the work across a variety of partners and players locally. Um, we'll be specifically writing up and this draft is um, now done and we'll be finishing a kind of report not only on what we learned about the, the capacities that were built within the sites, but the process of how we went about it. Um, my lead evaluator, again, Mary Aschetz, is uh, finishing that now. Um, that will be available on Casey's website in our knowledge management system as well. Um, more importantly, I just felt that I've now used this process of assessing, particularly when there's um, differences in implementation, but a shared understanding of uh, the staging of developmental work uh, for a variety of some initiatives that are getting going. It's been a big plus for me to strengthen our process or implementation evaluation uh, and not leave it solely in the kind of mind and purview of the evaluator, but really get the implementation uh, understood much better by those on the ground who are implementing. Um, I'll pause, I'll stop there and uh, for any questions and leave some room as well. well great, thanks Tom. Uh, you know, if anybody's got a question, please use the chat box to um, put your question in there. We, we're, we are coming a little bit close to the end of the hour here, so timing is good. Um, while folks are thinking about that and uh, typing, just a couple of questions that I had. Um, and I'm intrigued by the individualized indicators uh, that you're using. Are, are there, are they, um, so I, you know, I understand you know, it makes sense if, if uh, you know, collaborations are already well developed and, you know, obviously you don't need to be pushing on that and maybe don't count it as an indicator. Um, but are there, is there enough similarity across these things when you're looking at the different communities you're working with to be able to aggregate? Um, so that maybe community A approaches something in one way with the same goal as community B, which is approaching, approaching it in a different way, but the, the outcome is the same. Can you, you know, are the outcomes uh, similar enough across communities that you can begin to tell the story of 
of uh, the total impact of what you're doing? I, um, and I'll, Scott, your first part of your question actually um, uh, is interesting because in many cases it, uh, coming up with individualized local indicators was important for a few reasons. I think the first was um, the recognition that, in fact, as you said, there were some things already in place. You know, some sites were just beginning perhaps with a more advanced collaborations already in place, with perhaps more advanced data infrastructure in place. Um, and so recognizing that people were not starting at the same uh, starting line or baseline. The second thing which was important was uh, the recognition that even though it was achieved, it didn't necessarily mean that it would stick around. So it forced a lot of the sites to consider these indicators as also things to watch and pay attention to. Because in a 10-year initiative, many of the sites also experienced that not everything was a linear progression, but in fact, um, advances perhaps in developing a strong workforce strategy might mean they lost some connection to um, uh, some other partners or players along the way. So there was this recognition that uh, not everything was just incremental uh, and stayed that way. So if you made it to an eight or a nine, you stayed that way, but that things could slip. And so keeping track of the slippage where things perhaps were achieved and lost, uh, a key partnership was gained, but there was a change in leadership. Um, so I think that, in addition, was important. Now, the similarities across sites, um, I'm looking at the data that we have so far. Um, there perhaps are two things. Uh, not everything was highly predictive in that, uh, let's say, a strong collaborative body in one community was able to achieve as much or more as perhaps a policy or system level change in another community that perhaps wasn't very collaborative in its nature. So in terms of volume and absolute numbers, not always. However, we are seeing patterns of similarity uh, around things which are sustaining beyond the KC investments and may in fact be scaling or replicated beyond the KC investments. So we are seeing some similarities in the categories around scale and sustainability uh, more so than I would say that we're seeing some similarities around whether they achieve the same level or volume of outcome indicators. Okay, thanks. Um, I put up the uh, summary evaluation, so just you know, as you're doing, as you're thinking about this, uh, please click all that apply there. I'll go ahead and ask another question uh, to Tom, and maybe the other part the other presenters can chime in as well if you've got perspectives on this. You know, it seemed to me that uh, you know one of the things that's really uh, you know wonderful if you're coming from a foundation perspective is the, is the ability to take maybe a, a little bit longer view <laughs> um, than, than perhaps a political leader or, or some other uh, um, official. Um, and, and so, you know, but that, that longer, longer term perspective is, is quite healthy, but it seems like there's maybe less of it out there than there had been you know, 10 or 15 years ago in society. And, um, you know, do you, do you encounter this sort of impatience for results uh, as you're doing your work? And, and how do you counter that and, and get people to think a little bit longer term in what they're doing? I didn't include uh, in this presentation, I was focusing specifically on the implementation aspect of the evaluation. Um, but we did struggle even with a 10-year commitment from our board of trustees as well as our staff, um, keeping people's attention and keeping people's interest. And one of those ways was to document uh, impacts on children and families along the way. Um, but do it carefully. And we did have uh, quarterly dashboards from sites that summarized, just as Liz pointed out, some things like job placements or kindergarten readiness scores. Um, not everything would change every quarter, but we were able to show updates over time. But we would also try to lift up for folks that the change at the neighborhood level or the population level 
would move more slowly. And so keep people's attention on the uh, both levels of change, both at the families that were being directly touched, as well as the all the families in the neighborhood, and showing that those necessarily don't happen on the same timetable. Um, also, I think putting in perspective the comparison to other like neighborhoods, simply to say that um, what was going on contextually or what's going on changed overall, and to not raise too many expectations that even in 10 years you could see a radical shift in a population's level of poverty. Great. Um, any of the other presenters have a perspective on that, of how to, how to encourage a, a little bit longer term planning horizon? Some good points there about, uh, you know, kind of some goodies along the way and, and comparisons. Yeah, Scott, this is Mylon. Uh, well, real quickly, the hierarchy that I talked about earlier uh, was uh, conceptualized as a way to give people some things to measure early uh, so that they, those concrete thinkers that we work with all the time, would have something to point to. Uh, while those who have a greater degree of, uh, of patience about the longer horizon would uh, have something further down the road that would be the indicators of systemic change. So we were trying to, uh, I guess, uh, provide a balance between the short term or, or immediate and the long term and the more systemic. Excellent. Yeah, I think that's it's a good set of uh, principles to lay out there, and I think all of you have done a great job of of sharing some ideas on how to do this kind of work and and keep people motivated. We are a little bit past our, our witching hour here, so we're going to close. But uh, if folks could please uh, click the evaluations, uh, just everything that applies, um, and then we'll get that feedback to, over to the presenters. Thanks, everybody, for, for being on today and, and to our presenters. I'm going to turn off the recording now.